Today's class, it's uh, going to be called Be Like Pilgrims on the Earth. And I'm going to start with a definition. So, um, it's, this isn't, well, as well, it's not going to be a part one and two. I should be able to get through all of it. But I, I'm going to have a follow up that deals more with devotion as well. I was watching one of those motivational speakers and he said something uh, interesting. It's funny, he's like charging people to uh, mentor with him, and his whole spiel is that uh, he's gonna make you a king, like so you could be a king in your life. And I was like, it sounds good, it sounds real good, but you know, obviously if there's no scriptures in there, you know, it don't matter, right? Like, you know, if you're gonna be doing all carnal stuff, it don't matter. But he said something, <coughs> and I'm gonna jack it up, because hey, the, the actual quote I couldn't find it again. And it said, um, the issue with most people and their depression and their issues and their struggle in life is that the world has put us in a position where we feel like if we're not constantly striving for something more, that we're not doing well. And we don't rest and appreciate where, where we're at. So, you know, you can have whatever measure of success you might have. And um, because you haven't taken that next step, you haven't gotten that promotion, you didn't buy that house, you're not driving the car that you want, that you start to feel a way about it. And um, he says you have to realize that that's part of the conditioning that the world has put into your head. Uh, because we don't stop and appreciate those things. And then he said something that made me start thinking a little bit, you know, obviously I'm going to think in the scriptures. He said, the answer to counteract that is to live a life of devotion and live a devoted life. And if you live a devoted life, instead of one where you're always striving for the next level, uh, you'll be at peace in those moments when you don't have what you think you need or want, and you can just focus on the present and be in the moment. And I said, okay, you know, we think devotion and all types of religious stuff comes up. I said, I want to do this from a biblical perspective, but it, it starts from a point of us understanding our role on this earth. So let me get the definition of devotion that I told you to pull up. I'm going to start with that. Uh, I think I had wanted a Google one and a regular one. So am I wrong? First, I said Google it, so I want the Google one first. Okay, devotion. Uh, so it says there's love, loyalty, or enthusiasm for a person, activity, or cause. Most people are going to look at religious observance or whatever, but I want that first one, right? It says love, loyalty, or enthusiasm for a person, activity, or cause. So we have a cause. We have a mission. We're not here to just sit idle. There's things we must do. And I think many of us, and, and I often see this from a lot of brothers and sisters, and it's a little easier for brothers to conceal it. And what I mean is not that they're actively trying to conceal it, because the men, right, when you get to a certain point, you get to go out on flyer missions and whatever, and, and we see your dedication to that. We see your love, we see your enthusiasm for going to teach and do that stuff. And then for sisters, they often feel challenged, right? Because they think the offices that they have in the school are not a way to show love, loyalty, or enthusiasm. Um, I'll give you the biggest one that we have here with sisters, and not just, I mean in IUIC, it's kitchen responsibilities. And um, I see a lot of times a lack of enthusiasm Sometimes there's no love in what's prepared, right? Sometimes we get some food and you're like, goodness, right? Um, but I definitely see a lack of enthusiasm and devotion towards those offices. And how many sisters create excuses in their mind as to why things can't get done. And I'm using the kitchen as one example, but it, I think it goes for a lot of other things that sisters are involved with. And um, that's why I say it's a little easier for men because we have our primary function of going out to teach and do that stuff. But we also, as brothers, can become complacent and not be living devotedly to the scriptures. I'll give you another example. Uh, you have a certain behavior here 
but at home, you run your house like Negroes. And then it rubs off on your kids. And then the effect of that is, I'm trying, right, some of us are trying to shelter our kids from the school system and the way their friends are in the world, but then your unruly kids, they come here and they're learning derogatory things, they're learning bad examples that they don't even learn from worldly people in the school system. And that's your fault as parents. That's your fault when your kids are like that. It's not that you have little demons, you do, but that's not the excuse, all right? That's your fault. Especially if you happen to listen to what we were going over with socialization in the radio show. And how important the family structure is. The scripture says we need to have our house in subjection, our kids in subjection with all gravity. Meaning it's a serious situation. And if you don't treat it serious at home, trust me, it shows here. And it's not our job to police every single thing, but when it becomes a problem and it affects the body, we certainly will. But I can tell which of you are actually good parents at home with your children and which of you are not, based on how your kids act here. So you can try to think you are, you can be mad, you can sit there and start turning all types of colors and your ears get warm. Many of you have opportunity to fix things. And if you live devotedly, if you have enthusiasm to the scriptures and to what the Most High has in store, you actually won't feel salty about it. And you're going to take these classes and you're going to go back and you're going to reassess, are you truly enthusiastic for this truth? Do you truly have love for what's been shown to you? All right? So that's that definition. Get me the next one. Uh, dictionary, I think, right? Or was it Webster? What order did I have it in? Hold on. Dictionary was the next one. Dictionary.com. All right, so dictionary.com says profound dedication. Devotion is profound dedication. So, listen, I understand things happen sometimes and we can't get something done. Occasionally, we might be late. Occasionally, some things may go on. But you do not put this first. God is supposed to be above everything. God is above all. And obviously, use common sense, brothers and sisters. Don't mean let your kid drop dead or your kid get sick or anything like that, right? But I hear excuses of my job. I hear excuses of my husband. That should never be an excuse. You need to do what you need to do regardless as to why things can't get done. Oh, I'm working and I can't do it. That's not profound dedication. You're profoundly dedicated to your job. You're profoundly dedicated to yourself and not to the things that are needful for the body. And it also shows that you're selfish and do not have a charitable spirit because that means someone else has to pick up your slack. That goes for any office that we have. So it says, uh, earnest attachment to a cause. I like the word earnest. An assignment or appropriation to any purpose. Uh, let me get the um, Webster definition. Hold on. I'll pull up a mind so I can read it. So it says religious fervor or piety. Uh, the one that I want is the second one, 2A. The act of dedicating something to a cause, enterprise, or activity. All right? Uh, B, it says the fact or state of being ardently dedicated and loyal. And a lot of the lack of this stems from us not really understanding that this is not our rest and that you're not of this world. And it's a fine line that we walk when we do that, all right? So scroll down a little, some antonyms. So I want you to understand how serious dedication is and devoted is. Because if you're not devoted, keep going, antonyms for devotion is hate, hatred, loathing, and rancor. So in absence of devotion, right, there's no lukewarm with the Most High. In absence of devotion, what you have is hatred for God and the truth. And this is one of those tricky ones where if I ask you, do you hate this body? No, of course not. Look at my fridges. I'm here. Look. But 
But if you're not devoted, then you hate this wall. That's the exact opposite of it. So there is no middle ground in this. The Most High says he either have us cold or hot. But if you're lukewarm, he's going to spew you out. Because it's the same thing. Yahweh says when I talk about stagnant, he goes, if you think about stagnant, stagnant means still. There's no such thing as really stagnant because as everybody else moves forward around you, you're actually further, falling further behind. So stagnant as a concept is not really accurate. Right? So if you're not moving forward, if you're not devoted, you're behind. So let's get Hebrews 11 and 13. <coughs> right? Yeah, your action is being inactive when you're stagnant. And if you don't have love for this, and, and by the antonym of devotion, it's hatred, then by extension, that means you love whatever else it is that's keeping you from being devoted to this. And for many of you, it's the world in some way, shape, or form. It's the things of here. Remember, Christ said if you love father, mother, daughter, brother, whatever it is, more than me, you're not worthy of him. And that doesn't just mean non-believers. It's funny how we compartmentalize things and try to section things off. If you, you can, if you choose your repenting family over what God commands you, then you're not worthy of him. Remember, uh, he wanted Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. All right? And we went over that when we went through faith, right? We were talking about he knew. But he understood what he said by promise of everlasting life. That basically said, I'll kill Isaac because I know you're going to resurrect him. And that's that confidence that, that we need to have in, in the whole Bible. So read Hebrews 11 and 13. The book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promises. But having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. So, don't lose sight of the word persuaded. All right, we're going to deal with some per persuasion later in the scriptures. But uh, we've gone over faith, and we've read Hebrews 11, and he gives you different examples of some of the forefathers and foremothers, and he says they all died in faith. Not receiving the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them. Meaning they convinced themselves and they trusted in God enough that they knew at some point, if they lived their life devoted, if they lived their life the way he commanded, that they would receive those things. And he says they embraced them and confessed, because to embrace those things means you will confess that you were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. We're going to come back to that line in verse 13. Read the next verse. For they say, for they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. So them that say these type of things, that embrace these things, that confess that they are strangers and pilgrims, they declare plainly that they seek a country. So, strangers, when we deal with the Bible, has multiple applications. We have the strangers that were amongst us, of the other nations. We were strangers to the covenants. Remember, I did a whole class on that, and the promises at one time. But then, we are also strangers in this present land, and in this present kingdom. Like, the literal meaning of strangers, right? And then it says pilgrims on the earth. So first I want to define strangers. All right? So bring that up. Whatever I had for you on strangers. And I didn't get into go to the devout definition yet. Uh, remind me to do that later because I had a few for devout. So get stranger. That was from Webster's, right? One who is strange, such as a foreigner. A foreigner. The scripture says our foremothers and our forefathers, we understood that we were strangers. That we were foreigners. So like if I go to Russia, I would be seen as a foreigner, as a stranger. So while you think this place is your rest and this is your home, it says by your very existence in this present world, you are foreigners. You Israelite brothers and sisters. 
You are foreigners. We are foreigners in this land. Scroll down. Is there anything else? A resident alien, right? We're a resident alien. One in the house of another as a guest, visitor, or intruder. A person or thing that is unknown or whom one is unacquainted. All right? So, foreigners, let's get the one from dictionary. All right, scroll down. All right. Okay, so it says, I want the third one. An outsider. An outsider. It says, we are foreigners. We are outsiders. And if you think about it, especially in light of recent events, how they tell us uh, we have religious freedom, we have First Amendment rights. Uh, they, listen, I was thinking on the show today. Uh, a Shia, if he decides, and it's evil as hell, obviously he won't do this because he's a printing man, that he wants to be identified as a she, right? The world will go to bat for him. It won't be, the, the women's movement won't be upset and say you're encroaching on us. It's, it's anti-feminine for you as a man to want to say that you're a woman. If uh, a Tara wanted to say that she was a he, everybody would support her. There's groups for her. There's, uh, they won't ban her from the internet as hate speech. But the minute a black, Hispanic, or native indigenous says that they're an Israelite, it is anti-Semitic, it is hate speech, and it must be shunned. Right now. That sounds like an outsider to me. So as long as you're going to go with what they want and you're going to be on their status quo, you're not a stranger to them. This is why it says we are peculiar people. Right? The most I call us peculiar. Uh, I was talking about holy, I think, last week, and I said it means set apart. We are reserved for something else. And, and I'm harping on this in such great detail because we must understand what our station is in this world. We are the base things, we are the lowest things in this present world to all the other nations. Remember, Deuteronomy 28, 37 says, among all nations whither the Lord shall lead you, we will be a proverb and a byword. So when you start to embrace that and you keep that in the forefront of your mind, now, instead of being comfortable here, you realize that you're just on an extended stay. And you're a visitor here. Because this is not our rest. Right? Let me get uh, a foreigner. Uh, you may want to say something, Ken. You want to say something? Are you going to do something? Uh, I don't think I have Psalms 135. Get that real quick because everything that Cap is saying is like so on point. And before we repented, we didn't consider ourselves to be peculiar. Right? In fact, some of us were followers that always wanted to fit in. Right? In fact, a lot of us, okay, myself included, because I didn't see the positive direction that my people were, were going, wanted to be like Esau. Right? You want to talk like Ken, you're like, well, damn, if they're successful like they are, maybe they got the formula. This is before the truth. Okay? Not realizing this scripture here. Okay? The book of Psalms, chapter 135, verse 4. For the Lord hath chosen Jacob unto himself, and Israel for his peculiar treasure. We are a peculiar treasure. So, when we preach and teach that what society is teaching today, for the example, like Kat brought out, all right, about you can choose who you want to be gender-wise, even though you have the genitalia of a man or a female, all right, you are peculiar nowadays if you don't agree with that. But we were always destined from the beginning. All Moses was doing here was reminding us Okay, and so, I'm sorry, this is not Moses. This is uh, all the most I was doing here. The Spirit of David was reminding us that we were, like Cap said, we're strangers in this land. Okay, strangers. Why? Because the general consensus says, right? That, matter of fact, general consensus says that we are strangers and weird and peculiar. Right? The mere fact that we wear fringes, 
People look at us like we're real. What, what, how do they say it? What's that? Are you, you trying sure? to change that though? You go to the stores lately and they put the fridges on everything because they want it to make it seem, right. they don't want you to be special. They don't want people coming at right. right to you asking what right. are those, why are you wearing that? Right. So if they make it a fashion trend, nobody's gonna think twice about it anymore. Yep. Yep. So it's all crafty, it's all crafty counsel. The for foreigner, um, the one from Merriam-Webster. We'll make it back to these scriptures in a second. A person belonging to or owing allegiance to a foreign country, all right, one not native to a place or community. Again, it says stranger, right? So we owe allegiance to a foreign country. Our allegiance is to God. That's what makes us foreigners. But we are not native to this place or community. The way the world is structured now, we're going to read later, right, where the scripture says all the foundations are out of course. This is, this is not our place. Yes, all this was made for us, but not in its present form. There needs to be change. There needs to be a baptism of fire to set it up for where we will no longer be foreigners. We will no longer be strangers, right? And then get me outsider. I think it was from dictionary. A person not belonging to a particular group. So we don't belong to this place. So now, go back to Hebrews. Read 11 and 13 again. The book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. So what this example is showing us in the scriptures is that in order to start taking those steps to being devoted to this, you can't just acknowledge that you're an Israelite. You can't just keep the commandments. Embracing it requires that you acknowledge that this is not your rest. That you acknowledge that you are a stranger and a pilgrim in this place. Read on. We're going to come back to the definition of pilgrim in a moment. Come up. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. Why? Because we know that we are strangers. A lot of times we read this scripture and we, and we only focus on the part where we say, when you say you're an Israelite, when you keep these commandments, you're saying you seek a country. No, we're saying plainly we seek a country because we're announcing that, yes, we know that we are strangers and we are pilgrims in the earth. Right? Come on. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. The Garden of Eden and when we had rulership under the kings of Israel. They said if we had been mindful of those things, we'd have had opportunity to return. They did not live a devoted life to the Most High. So we're condemned to repeat those mistakes until we acknowledge it. I often get on, on, on us when we're doing classes and we mention prayer, how there's scriptures that speak about how we need to acknowledge the sins of our forefathers also, not just ours. And occasionally I even forget in, in my prayers. But every now and then it'll pop in there and I'll be like, hey, give me for my sins and the sins that all our forefathers have done. Because at the end of the day, we're them in some manifestation, right? And it was by that mistake. So they didn't live a life of devotion, so they lost it. If Eve was devoted and her love and enthusiasm to what was the most high, this is what the most high said, she would have never listened to the serpent. And if Adam was devoted to the most high, so he was devoted to his wife. Well, you brothers, of your wife's skirt. Listen, love your wife. We've gone over that at length. I'm not saying do everything the Bible commands you to do as a husband to your wife. But your devotion is to God. Your devotion is to God. I see us. I see us or I see us? Okay. Right. You're trying to, is there a single Northern Kingdom sister here? Are you trying to impress? Yeah, okay. Right. Okay. Oh, getting ready for Passover. He's getting ready for Passover. He's going fishing at Passover. It's fishing. Come. <laughs> Be quiet, bro. The way the way that 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 the Most High has things set up perfectly, and he can't be found a liar. So, the way that we know that we're outsiders and strangers and pilgrims and and foreigners and everything else, because he said in that place that you were not called my people, and we're not called his people anywhere. So there's nowhere in the earth that we can go to and be recognized as the Israelites. 
it's taking on the heritage that he made for us from the, from the very beginning to, to that starts, it doesn't finish because the scripture says not all Israel is of Israel, right? It's not just knowing, but it's actually applying. Dalelus! <laughs> right. I see it! <laughs> Hey, that's that's heavy. It's right. It says that in the place where you are not my people, there you will be called the sons of the living God. Okay? So you have to realize that. We are sons of God. Right. 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 But with that, in this present state, we have to acknowledge that we are also pilgrims and strangers here. And we're going to talk about pilgrims and, and, and that pilgrimage, right? The, the, the biblical context of it in a moment. Read verse 16. But now they desire a better country that is in heaven. We desire something better. Better than what the kingdom that we had under the kings were. Better than what this present world is. And if you desire something better, then you should not have contentment. But we want better here. And I'm not saying don't do better here. We're going to read Jeremiah later. But your motivation for doing better here is not to maintain the state of this place. You have to be devoted. And when God is first, when you're, and when you're enthusiastic, devoted means you're enthusiastic about it. I got to clean the toilets today? All oh, praises I get to clean the toilets in the congregation of the Lord. Should be like, oh gosh, I'm going to go. These kids peeing on the toilet seat. What? Not flushing. Train your kids. They shouldn't do that. But you should be happy to do that stuff, right? David said, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the kingdom. Some of y'all got your offices and you're grumpy as hell. Don't worry. We're going to start kicking you out of the offices if you can't show devotion for them. You can sit down and then you won't have any opportunity to apply anything that we're talking about here. And then don't blame us. And that day when you sit before the judgment seat, you're going to try to blame us. They didn't let me do anything. And the Most High is going to show you all your wickedness. And you'll be like, damn. There ain't going to be no talking back after that. Right? So read verse 16 again. But now they desire a better country that is in heavenly. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God. For he hath prepared for them a city. And we glaze over this one too. I was reading this last night and I stopped and I had to like meditate on it for a moment. Do you know God is ashamed of us? Based on what this scripture says? Hmm. Read it again. But now they desire a better country that is in heavenly. Meaning in this present world, it's not better, it's not heavenly. What does it say? Come on. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God. God is ashamed of us in this present world. He's ashamed to be called our God, not proud. So you can imagine that indignation, right? Why he's so wrathful in his punishment. He's ashamed to be called our God the way we are now. And that, that thing cut me. Like, like it almost brought me to tears. I said, goodness. I said, I never really thought about it that way. And then to see this, I said, oh my goodness. I said, he's ashamed, right? Come on. For he had prepared for them a city. Because he prepared for us a city. So we have to consider this, right? Jump back up to 14. This is what he's talking about, right? Verse 14. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. Right? So this is the city. This is the country that he's prepared for us, right? Jump up to 13 again because we're going to go to the definition of pilgrim. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Alright, so look up pilgrim for me. One who journeys in foreign lands. One who journeys in foreign lands. So there is a little difference. They're related, stranger and pilgrim. But it says, we are here on a journey in a foreign land. And our journey is repentance. This is where you'll hear me say, don't say you're repented. Repentance is a journey. It is till the death. Because we live in a polluted world. So you are, whether you think you're good or not, trust me, none of us are. If, if you swim in polluted waters, 
you may come out of it okay, right? You can go and detox, but in that moment, until you get your medicine right, it's affecting you, right? If you eat polluted food or you drink polluted things, it's going to affect you. Likewise, your spirit gets tainted in this polluted world. And the way we cleanse it, the way we decontaminate, is by following God's process. We keep these laws. We come together with like-minded spirits, keep ourselves away from that stuff. You're programmed all the time in your workplace where we're forced to not be with our people, when you're not mindful of the time, when you're, in, when you're with the indiscreet, like the scripture says, right? Because, you know, with, nobody's telling you cut off relationships with your unbelieving family, but be mindful of the amount of time that you spend there. Be mindful of how that time is spent. Don't be unequally yoked. So it says, one who, who journeys in foreign lands, a wayfarer, all right? Get me the one in a uh, dictionary. It says a person who journeys, especially a long distance. I don't want that one. It says a traveler or wanderer, especially in a foreign place. That's the one that's talking about us. Well, scroll down to words related to pilgrim. It says traveler, settler, crusader. Right? We're crusaders, right? We stand up for God's gospel. Wanderer, pioneer, sojourner. Sojourner. So go ahead and click on Sojourner for me. This should be the last of my definitions in a little while. Uh, and it says Sojourner. And this was most profound to me. It says a temporary state. So as pilgrims here, we have to realize that our stay here is temporary. And not try to establish and build this world up. And, and, and my, my aim is for you to try to, in order to be devoted to this the way you need to be, you need to acknowledge and accept. I, I've spoken about this in different terms, just not with these words. When I say your television program is more important than what you got to do for the body or for your study time, your, your sleep at times is more important, right? But not when it comes to like partying or something else, right? But... With monkey, monkey bars, go to monkey <laughs> We'll prioritize things for ourselves, for this world, but not for this truth, not for this wall, not for your brother and sister in this thing. And it's because you don't really believe that you're just here temporarily. And whether you believe it or not, guess what you are? I'm going to read later in Ezra's. Those who are condemned are condemned. And the scary thing is, is most of those that are condemned won't realize it till that day. So there's a lot that goes on here, right? We have that predestination, we have everything else. But what we do know, and what we can't control, is our actions in this place that is temporary. And our devotion and our enthusiasm on where our love lies and where that's directed. Yeah. That's, that's real heavy. That, that's the reason why Christ said that on that day he would say I never knew you although you cast out <laughs> demons in his name because those people had strong delusions on them and thought they were serving the Lord correctly and a lot of us are doing the exact same thing we think we're doing things according to what God says but on that day he's going to say those those words that none of us want to hear depart from me for I never knew you bring it out it's scary yeah. it's scary it is oh gosh my computer well I don't need any more stuff updated um Technology. It's like uh, when we were network marketing, and, and what it and what it, uh, it was a lot. You used to say this a lot uh, when you were in your prior profession. It was like, yeah, you know, I moonlight as that. This is my job. Oh, subsidizing. My, yeah, my job. That's uh, my job. Subsidizes my business, right? That's how we need to feel about this truth, right? Remember, the scripture says this is our profession. So to ask you what your profession is. Don't be like the, the Athenians in 300. I'm a potter. I'm an artiste. I'm a poet. He says, what's your profession? They're, like, oh, they're warriors, right? They know what their profession is. Our profession is the scriptures. That's right. <laughs> and whatever job you do is your job. Because money answer of all things. And by the sweat of your brow will, we, will you eat your bread, as was prophesied. That's all that is. And that doesn't mean be, don't be good at your job. 
Contrary-wise, we've got over classes and scriptures. That be the best at your job. Be the best one there. But never trim your ways and make sure that your love is for this. Your devotion is for this. Some of y'all love sleep. Oh, man, I need my sleep. I don't know why. You're not there for most of it. It's true. Right? No, I saw this a comedian. He said it. He goes, the only part of sleep that you're there for is right when you fall asleep. So really what you're chasing is that moment when the melees come and you're like, oh, here it comes. <laughs> and then you wake up and you're like, damn it, the alarm goes off, whatever it is. The hell do you love sleep so much? You're not even there. I like being awake. I enjoy my wakefulness. That's when I experience things. Okay. Right? <laughs> Some of y'all is all about the memes. Oh, man, my God, the itis. Oh, 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 that'll wait till tomorrow. Come on. And listen, I'm not saying be unhealthy. Right? There's a balance, right, for all this stuff. You're not of service if you're sick and dead, right? So, but put yourself in the right frame of mind. You, trust me, many of us love other things more than the truth. And if it's not all the time, there's moments. You have those moments where you stop, right? You see, like, and it was at that moment that they knew that they had up, right? You gotta think about those things and say to yourself, gosh, is this one of those moments where I'm gonna show devotion? Or I'm gonna be selfish and be about myself? And examine that. Let me get Psalms 39 and 12. So, uh, but in order to get to that place, you first must acknowledge and, and constantly remind yourself that you are not part of the matrix. Right? Going back to that movie, The Matrix. Everybody that was plugged in, that was their reality. They didn't realize that they were plugged into something that wasn't real. It was not until you were unplugged that you did it. And then there's that scene, right? And for time's sake, I didn't queue up videos and stuff. I'm not good like that yet. Get your definitions and articles, not videos. All right? Where he's walking down the street, and it felt so real and everything, and then he saw the woman in the red dress, right? And the woman in the red dress was the Asian and everything. He was like, listen, it's even unplugged, the matrix is so convincing that you'll think that you're a part of the system that you're a part of the construct. So it's, it's a constant awareness that we have to have and an acknowledgement. So again, here's some more stuff to add to. Those of you who suck at your prayers, almost every class I'm giving you little things that you can add into your prayers. And let the Most High know that you realize you are a visitor here, that you are a pilgrim, a sojourner, and a stranger in this journey towards repentance. So read Psalms 39 and 12. David understood it. The book of Psalms, chapter 39, verse 12. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear unto my cry. Hold not thy peace and my tears, for I am a stranger with thee, and a sojourner, as all my fathers were. That was his prayer. He said, hear my prayer. I am a stranger with thee, God and a sojourner as all my fathers were. It was all for a dispensation of time so that what the plan that was laid out from the beginning can be made to be fulfilled here through these last days. And he acknowledged this. Let's get 1 Peter 2 and 11. The book of 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 11. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims Abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul. So he says, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims. A lot of times we glaze over that and we don't think about that. He says, I beseech thee as strangers and pilgrims. And then, of course, he's giving some advice here. He says, because you're strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul. We're going to deal with that some more later on, all right? Part of being a stranger and a pilgrim is abstaining from the things of this world, right? The things that the Most High says not to do. You got something? Yeah, the, uh, the uh, definition of the word beseech means to ask urgently or fervently. Mm. So Peter is fervently and he's urgently acknowledging that he's a stranger and a pilgrim of this earth. That's very heavy. That's something that, that I guarantee that none of us... I read the scripture literally hundreds of times and I've never thought of it like that. Like, that's something that the forefathers always understood that we have to put into our mind 
as we go through this walk every single day. And I gotta tell you, I really have no idea where the inspiration for the class, I, I think I said the devotion piece, but then that started, I heard something else about being a pilgrim. And like a pilgrimage, I said, wait a second. I've seen that word quite a bit in the scriptures. I said, pilgrim's in there, and I started doing research, and that's a Roman. So that's how the spirit works sometimes, though. I would have never thought to look that up and focus on that. That's, that's never been emphasized to me that way. So I'll praise to the Most High that he's able to bring that forth. See, this is why, man, you can read the Bible a bunch of times, right, and, and still miss things that are in there, right? I, sometimes, sometimes I get worried, and I'm like, gosh, am I ever not going to have a class? Like, what, if, what if it runs out? Like, right, I've been going, what, three and a half years here, almost every Sabbath, coming up with a class. Like, what if I run out? And I said, stop being carnal. The Most High is going to supply you. And if you run out, i got bigger problems to worry about. Couldn't that mean he stopped dealing with me? So I said, let me, let me, let me not worry about that. Right? And sure enough, he, he, stuff comes to the forefront. Right? And the more you learn, the more you study, the more you can rein those thoughts into what you learn and not let Caesar Borgia creep in and all that other stuff. Right? Because I, I always got to uh, like sift it through a sieve and make sure it lines up with what the scriptures are saying, right? And not try to go left and speak my own thoughts, right? So this is why the scripture says wait on your ministry and stuff like that. Um, ask the questions, bring them out. Some things, if I'm really not sure, I'll go and I'll ask my leaders and hey, you know, I was thinking about this, you know, this is the way uh, um, I'm looking at it, is that correct? And you know, sometimes no, right? You bug the hell out. Other times it's yeah, or maybe it's some adjustment that needs to be done. Let me get 2nd Ezra 8.39. The book of 2nd Ezra, chapter 8, verse 39. But I will rejoice over the disposition of the righteous, and I will remember also their pilgrimage, and the salvation and the reward that they shall have. Our pilgrimage is now. Our pilgrimage is the lives we live and have lived. And if it be the Lord's will and we regenerate, who knows, right? There, there, there's no scripture to necessarily tell us that there will be no more, you know, one time that was kind of trying to float around, or there's not going to be any more regeneration after this. We don't really know that. We do know we're close, right? And as you get closer, we don't need to regenerate again because the next regeneration is the dead in Christ rising first when that happens, right? But the pilgrimage is the lives we've lived and how we've dealt with them in this world. And this is why he says, I will rejoice over their pilgrimage and the salvation and the reward that they shall have. Because our pilgrimage is what we're doing here. Keeping these laws, statutes, and commandments as foreigners, as strangers in this land. So he's going to rejoice over our pilgrimage. We cannot be too comfortable understanding that what he's going to rejoice over is our acknowledgement that we're strangers, that we're on a temporary stay here. And you acknowledge that, not just by saying it and saying it in your prayers, but by your actions. Like Peter just said, I beseech you, strangers and pilgrims, abstain from these things. Live devotedly. Focus on what the Most High requires. Read on. Like as I have spoken now, so shall it come to pass. For as the husbandman soweth much seed upon the ground, and planteth many trees, and yet the thing that is sown in his season cometh not up. Neither doth all that is planted take root. Even so is it of them that are sown in the world. They shall not all be saved. So he, when he says them that are sown in the world, he uses an example of farming here. And he goes, even when you plant good seed, not all are saved. Not all of it grows the way it needs to grow. So inherently, right? All Israel has that chance to repent. All of us are that good seed. But going back to like what you had said, they are not all Israel that are Israel. Not all of them will, will come to fruition. So he says uh, that all that is planted does, is not, does not take root. Even so would have been that are sown in the world. We are sown in the world, but we are not of it. This is why it says we're sown in the world. It's that pilgrimage. It's that temporary stay that we're here. And not, it doesn't always take root. Come on. Actually, I'm sorry. Jump to verse 50. Verse 50. 
for many great miseries shall be done to them that in the latter time shall dwell in the world. So stop being so comfortable and thinking that you're not a stranger here, thinking that this is your place. It says many great miseries will be shown in the latter time to them that dwell in the world. Come on. Because they have walked in great pride. And that great pride manifests itself in your lack of devotion, your lack of love and enthusiasm for this walk. Because you're prideful about it. You're not actively saying, oh, God won't judge me for this. But all these little actions, all these little moments where you have the ability. Remember I said, it was at that moment that you knew you messed up. We have to be more conscious of those moments where we make that choice of being devoted to the Most High or being devoted to something else. Yeah, He's merciful. Yeah, well, Don't take that for granted. Don't abuse that. That's abusing grace. Don't be presumptuous in that. Because if Christ returns tomorrow, what's going to be your excuse as to why you, oh, well, I was doing this first, then I was going to be devoted to you. And you won't use those words, but it'll say, I'm going to focus on this in my life first. I was trying to do this first. I was trying to get this right. And then I have more time for you. That, that's not going to abide in those last days when you sit that day. So I say, to, you know, you should hasten to flee these times. And the only reason you would be so okay with choices like that on the regular is that you, you fail to remember that you're not part of this place, that you're a foreigner here. Right? Remember our history. Get Exodus 12 and 40. There's nothing new under the sun. And the example in Egypt is one of the most profound. The book of Exodus, chapter 12 and verse 40. Now the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. We sojourned in Egypt. We, we were on a pilgrimage there. We were temporary visitors. To sojourn is a temporary stay. Does 430 years sound temporary? But it was temporary. Just like now. Right? From, from, from the most recent captivity up till now. Right? All the different captivities. They were, we were sojourning. All we've ever done outside of the time that we've had the rulership in the kingdom was be foreigners somewhere. So remember when it says the prophecy, thou shalt see it no more again. We've been foreigners all our lives. All our iterations. So that's another way that you could tell uh, we're not anti-Semitic because the ones that are there, they say they're home. The Bible says you're not home until Christ return again and bring that heavenly kingdom, that, that better place, that better city, a heavenly one. So we were sojourners in Egypt 430 years, just like now. Just like now, even in these last days, right? Let me get First Chronicles 29 and 15. And, I, I'm, and just like most things, this, the Bible has um, a lot of repetition. And um, if I were to list every scripture that talks about us being strangers, pilgrims, sojourners, I mean, we could go on and on and on. There's, there's hundreds. There's literally hundreds of entries. So now, right, here's a nice study thing to break up the monotony of your studies. When you review these notes, go and look for the other scriptures that talk about being strangers and pilgrims. Fortify yourself some more. Read, understand, try to put it in the context of the class. Right? First Chronicles 29, 15. First Chronicles chapter 29, verse 15. For we are strangers before thee, and sojourners, as were all our fathers. Our days on the earth are as a shadow, and there is none abiding. So I've told you this before, I don't, I don't talk out of my behind, right? I'm always going to validate it with scriptures. We've always been strangers and sojourners. As all our fathers, our days on the earth are as a shadow. All our days on the earth has been... Hey, even when we had the kingdom, that was only for a dispensation of time. 
when we had Saul and David and Solomon and the other kings of Israel? Right, that's that, that's a heavy point because Chronicles was during that peace time when like we actually had the kingdom and they still acknowledged that they were still search owners and strangers. Yep. David is the king of Israel at this point. About to give his reign to his son Solomon. And he still acknowledged that he's a sojourner. With a crown on his head, he realized this was not his rest. Because he understood. He had devotion in his heart towards the Most High. David's a wonderful example of that. Because, I mean, if you think about it, all the kings were imperfect. All of them. All of them has it, but they understood the Lord, they understood His mercy, they understood, you know, it's not for us to have license to sin in that, but it's to realize it's not an unattainable thing. You just got to make yourself that you wrap your head around all these little aspects. And David understood that. That's how he was able to remain humble. Right? Yeah, there was moments where they went off, but that's how he was able to remain humble in that. Right? So, he's basically saying the same thing here that he said in Psalms 39. So I'll let you know that David had a continual understanding of this, right? David was obviously no king by accident. He was very wise. We talk about Solomon a lot. David was very wise. We understand the Bible says Solomon was the wisest, but David was very wise, right? I, I would almost say he was maybe even more devoted to the Most High than Solomon was. That's my opinion. I'm not going to tell you that scripturally. But when you read the examples of how they both lived their life, I think, I think uh, David was a little more devoted in, in how he went about things, right? Look, I went way back to when the way he dealt with Saul, right? I mean, he had every justification to, to, to revenge himself, right? And go against him, and he did it. When you read his Psalms, you, and that's what's beautiful about the Psalms that David wrote, you get into what he, you don't have to wonder what he was thinking as he was going through all that. If you read the right Psalms, he lets you know what he was thinking as he went through all that. And it wasn't an African-American thought. It wasn't a Hispanic thought, right? He was thinking according to that Godhead mentality and how he handled himself with that. Uh, let's get John 17 and 6. Let's, let's get it from the one true king. The book of St. John, chapter 17 and verse 6. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Now, very specifically... In the context of this time period, but we know the scriptures are for every time period, he's speaking about the 12 disciples, very specifically. But these scriptures are here for us to this day, and by extension, it is applies to us as well as repenting Israelites. So read that verse again. I have, manif I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and have kept thy word. And they have kept thy word. Come on. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me. And they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee. And they have believed that thou didst send me. Right? So he's letting you know, hey, before I'm going to tell you what I'm about to tell you, I, I, I need you to understand, as he's praying to the Most High Father, I've done everything. I've given them all, right? So they know, they understand these things. They knew that they were pilgrims. They knew that they were sojourners. They knew what commandments they needed to keep. They knew what their mission was. Come on. I pray for them. I pray not for the world. Oh, wait a second. I thought God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He says, I pray for these individuals. Not for the world. Now, this is why I say you understand that this is kind of, in a way, hip talk. He's not just talking about the disciples. Because if that was the case, then that means he only died for the disciples, right? Clearly, no. His whole, his whole intent was to save all Israel. So he says, I pray for them, meaning Israel. I pray not for the world. Come on. But for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. Because we are foreigners. Our allegiance is to God, not to, not to the world, not to anything else, right? Read on. And all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. Right, and he's saying, hey, and, and mine are thine, because why? He knows he's going to be the king. This is what you've given me, come on. 
And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thy own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. Meaning there's some of us who are reserved, right? We've gone over this at great length. Some are reserved to destruction. Some are reserved to eternal damnation. Some are reserved to eternal life. Come on. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that th thou gavest me, I have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. He's talking about Judas, right? He says all of them are preserved by the actions, by the mission that I've given, except for Judas, right? Come on. And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the word and the world hath hated them. The world hates us because God and Christ have given us, the Israelites, the word only. Come on. Because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Christ himself understood this and he said this. We are not of the world, just like he was not of the world. Just like he so yes, we're not the son of God. We're not the ultimate king in that word manifest. But remember when it says joint heirs together and the partakers, they hated him just like they hate us. He declared the same things. Listen, the reason Rome really wanted to kill him is because he was declaring plainly that he seeks a country. Remember, Rome didn't want to deal with the squabbles of heresy and all this other stuff. It wasn't until they basically, they basically sold out and they, and they let Rome in on the on the secret that the kingdom of heaven uh, is only for us and the rest of them are not going to be in rulership. It was treason. He was basically killed for treason, if you really think about it. Right? And they framed it as treasonous acts. But read this verse again. Uh, 17 was it? No, 14, sorry. Verse 14. I have given them thy, wo thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. We are not of this world. Even though we are in it. Even though we are sown in it. Like it said in Ezra. We are not of this world. And that's a hard thing for us. to Because basically we exist in two ways. Right? And so you know. If you, if you try to get too crazy about it. You wrap your head around it. It's weird. Right? But it, it, again. It goes back to like the matrix. He says it's so real that if you die in there, even though you're not physically in there, even though you're not, your body's somewhere else, right? But your spirit is in that world, and your spirit can be condemned in that world. So we, we have to continue to embrace and accept that we are separate. And, and I get it, man. The way life is and the way we are, it's hard to, to kind of walk that way and think that way all the time. We get so wrapped up in the mundane that it's easy to let that escape you. But this is why even more we need to keep that in the forefront of our minds. Don't fall into a, a routine of just keeping these commandments. You must always have it in the forefront of your mind. Just like David, as the king, in rulership with a kingdom, was able to acknowledge that he is a stranger. All right? Read on. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. Right. And the reason he don't pray that he takes us out of the world is because he knows the Most High is going to rejoice over our pilgrimage in this world. We must go through this. The kingdom of heaven, right, is, it's, it's a straight gate. It's a narrow path to get there. And we have to do it amidst the pollution of this present world. Come on. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Uh, this whole chapter basically here, he says it a bunch of times. He reiterates it multiple times. He says it again, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Come on. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And the word will keep you from the pollutions of this world. Not one and done. But constantly, that devotion to it will keep you. It's like uh, people who are asthmatic and they need their inhaler, right? Or you have a condition and you got a, I don't know, what is it, angina, I have to take my nitrous, my nitrous pill, whatever it is. 
You need that stuff. Diabetics need their insulin. We need this word in order to deal with what we have in this world, right? Come on. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. So our walk in this life is symbolic of the pilgrimage that Christ had here. And this is why this was the example that he was, where he was tempted in all things, but didn't do it. Right? And we're going to talk about later briefly, right, shortly, how... Uh, the scripture tells you they had to take it. The world is so polluted that they even had to take Christ away when they did. Because they said if he would have stayed any longer, he might have actually said. So when they tell you that he uh, was the, is it the Da Vinci Code, that he had a kid and all this other, he didn't do none of that. Right? Right. No, no, no. And don't they got another one where he's gay? Where they say he's gay? Then they try to do something like that now. They're going to put something on Netflix that he was gay. Goodness. Uh, Christians got all up in arms about that one, right? So, we, uh, did you read verse 19? Go ahead. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. So he says, for our sakes, he sanctifies himself, so that we also might be sanctified through the truth. And he just said what the truth was. He said, thy word is the truth, Lord. So we're sanctified by his word. And that's what keeps us from succumbing to the foreign influences here in this world. Because this is not our rest, right? So we must understand the dangers of the world. This is not a safe place for us. But some of us live that way. This is, and this is the valley of the shadow of death. That's why he, what do you think he said, I sent you out as sheep among wolves? We're sent out for the slaughter, the world hates us. Like I brought out earlier, I, they would, I, I could go and, and clearly, and listen, it's not just genitalia that separates us. Women have different insides, right? Uterus, ovaries, all this other stuff. We don't have that, and vice versa. But they will accept that, and they will fight for you. And day by day, I mean, this world will fight for you for that. But you bring forth, and you say that you're the Israelites, they're not going to accept that. And you get all this rhetoric, this popular persuasion behind that now. For simply stating the truth. Because you know it's a lie. They're basically forcing you to accept the lie when you accept transgender. They're forcing you to accept the lie. Refer to her as she. Him as she. Right? So what a man, it's man. You see that video? <laughs> hey, they're 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 going so far to protect that lie that there's people that have taken that transition and become transgenders and become men or women, whatever, that they're doing testimonies now and putting them on yeah, YouTube. Yeah, spreading it and YouTube's cutting And out. YouTube is taking those videos down. That's how far they're going to protect So so that. so uh, these are actual people who went through the transition surgery. They changed their parts and all that, they took the hormones. And they go on video to talk about how it was a mistake. They regret doing it. They put it on YouTube. The reason you don't see them is that YouTube knocks them down right away. So there was someone that had put out a video where they were able to, they basically look for them at this point to try to catch them before YouTube takes them down and then tries to show snippets of them to try to bring awareness to the fact that, it's, that they, they want to protect that thing so much that they don't even want the people that are transgender that went through the surgery to talk about how they regretted it to put that information out there. That's, that's one of the biggest, I'm harping on that one because transgenderism is one of like, like that's like the most obvious, right? Like somebody could try to debate you, like we know that we're the Israelites, but somebody will, will, will debate you to the end with that and say it's circumspect or whatever, whatever you're doing, right? But I mean, how do you, I mean, it's a bold lie. So it's okay for me to identify as something so long as it fits what you want. But if I identify as an Israelite, that's forbidden. You lose your job over that. The Micah 2 and 10. So you gotta understand the dangers of this world and by that also understanding that this place is not our rest. And that's a constant thing. I know people are like, yeah, I know it's not my rest. No, you don't, because your actions say otherwise. Micah chapter 2 and verse 10. Arise ye and depart, for this is not your rest. And arise ye and depart, if you think about it, there's nowhere in the world that you can go, right, to escape the world's ideologies, right? 
There's nowhere you can go. Remember, it says we need that heavenly, right? So the arise and depart means keeping the word of God. Set yourself apart by being peculiar, by keeping these peculiar commandments. You guys are? Yeah, you can't even go to the so-called holy land because they accept homosexuality over there. Right. Oh yeah, Tel Aviv is like one of the largest, I think it's worse than Atlanta. Right. And go over there and you ain't got no rulership over there. They're gonna make you join their fellow church. <laughs> I had Ray, like, Ray from Atlanta, he was like, yes, and so while he was yes, and I said that, so you, you agreed. <laughs> Tel Aviv is worse than Atlanta, no, if they have a huge uh, uh, thing going on over there, like, super gay city. They have the gay parade and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tel Aviv, so don't think, don't think it, uh, come on, is that, is that a heavenly place? Right? Hey, you saw the video that Bishop put up with the dude taking a dump by the ruins and stuff like that. Horrible. That's heavenly? That stuff like that ain't gonna happen in the kingdom, are you kidding me? Damn. Ridiculous. Read this, Micah 2 and 10. Arise ye and depart, for this is not your rest. This is not your rest. You are strangers and pilgrims. You are sojourners here. This is a temporary state. Come on. Because it, it, because it is polluted. Because this place is polluted. It is dangerous. The world will hate you because of the word. Because the word is the truth. And everybody wants to live in the lie of what this world is. Come on. It shall destroy you, even with the sword destruction. If you don't arise and depart from it, if you don't embrace that this is not your rest, that you, if you don't embrace that you are a pilgrim and a stranger here, this place will destroy you. It is polluted. Right? Read 1 Corinthians 15, 33. We're damaged. I'm telling you, we are damaged every day just by the mere fact that we live here. You are influenced every day, every moment, by everything that's around you. So whether you accept it or not, or whether you're, none of us is above the, the corruption of evil communication, is, is above the pollutions of this world. None of us, because Christ wasn't either. He just endured it. They say we're marketed to, by the time we're 21, like over a million something times, like a crazy number. In those marketing messages, there's subliminal messages. Right. Alright, so whether you realize it or not, I'll give you an example. You can that always brings this out, okay? Around Christmas time, they always play Christmas carols, right? To the point, could I even call myself this year I was humming that crap. That's right. <laughs> I was like, whoa, what the hell is this? <laughs> and that's so what I know. carries all I want for Christmas is the freaking chair. Right? Lord forgive me, I must repay. Right. I'm so mad that I can't hear that song anymore. <laughs> Bro, that's like, that's like, I know, right? So when you're watching commercials, and you see nowadays, because those of you that were 50 years old or whatever, you remember, you never saw, you didn't even see Southern Kingdom in commercial when we were kids. Okay? And now you see Southern Kingdom with Esau. Now you see Jake with Esau in commercial. Subliminally with a Cheerios commercial. They try to make it wholesome, you know, well, you know, have good health, and in there they mix interracial marriage. Subliminally. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Be not deceived. That's why I say none of us are above the pollutions of this world. This is why it says be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manner. All of us, right? All of us, me included. Evil communication has an impact on you. We have a remedy for it. But don't underestimate the strength of the wiles of the devil. Right. All right? That's it. it it'll, it'll pull you in. It'll suck you in. Right? Read on. Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. What does he mean by that? I speak this to your shame. Why did he? He says, he says awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. What does he mean? Uh, Morty. 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 Hello. Hello. They're saying like we got access to the truth, we got all these classes and all this, but we're not taking advantage right, of it like we should. Right. We know. You know that you're pilgrims. You know that you're sojourners. You know that the truth is there. You know what should be done. He goes, 
He goes, I speak this to your shame. He says, you should awake to righteousness and sin not. He, some have not the knowledge of God, meaning they're gonna, those people get fewer stripes, right? But you know better. You have what's in front of you available. And for you to have a lack of devotion in that is shameful. We already went over how he's ashamed of us in this present world. And then on top of that, you're fed with more knowledge than men understand. And yet we still fall short. Shame on us for that. Deep shame. We should know better. Wisdom of Solomon 4 and 10. For revenge. For the intensive listeners in class, we're going to go over that. Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 4 and verse 10. He pleased God and was beloved of him, so that living among sinners, he was translated. Right. And listen, again, I said, I said our, our pilgrimage here is, is an example of Christ's pilgrimage. That's why he said he came like us to be tempted in all things like us. To show us that it can be done. And he says, so he pleased God. God said he will rejoice over our pilgrimage when we read in Ezra, right? So it's the same thing here. He says, because we live among sinners. And guess what? It's the same thing. Us living among sinners, if we endure to the end and follow this prescribed plan, this course of action, it says we will be translated. Which is that changing in the, blink, in the twinkling of an eye that it speaks about. Right? Come on. Yea, speedily was he taken away, lest the wickedness should alter his understanding, or deceit beguile his soul. He said, speedily Christ was taken away, lest that wickedness should alter his understanding, or deceit beguile his soul. So it said it would have altered even his understanding. And mind you, this is this is a, a an individual that as a baby, though he couldn't talk was as aware as you are as an adult. Right? So can you imagine, like with all that power, having to have someone wipe your behind, feed you, and all that, that's gonna happen when we get old, but when you're <laughs> having a level of awareness, like you're grown, right? Like a baby doesn't understand that, a regular baby doesn't get it, right? They just know this is, they don't even know what poop is until you tell them what poop is, right? Christ understood all things from, from the moment he was born. Yet had all these urges, right? So the, the crying, the wanting the milk, what the heck is this? I gotta go. Oh, he's like, oh, I'm pooping, right? I use that as an example to just show you how, how much we take minor things for granted. And they said, so meaning he, all his knowledge, he had it already from a baby. Just couldn't write it, couldn't say it yet. So everything that he was teaching as an adult, he knew as a baby. He entered the world like that. Hey, he was so already knowledgeable that in the womb he made John the Baptist Elizabeth, right? Right, right. She when, felt when she touched the baby, John the Baptist moved. Inside of y'all look at me like I'm crazy. No. I'm seeing y'all faces. We went over that. Solomon, they're looking at me like I don't know what I'm talking about right now. <laughs> y'all know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yes, sir. That's the power that he had that it says in the scriptures that Elizabeth, John the Baptist was in her womb. And he moved. Leap for joy, it says. Right? That's the word to well, use. Well, I also want to show you that John had a little bit of understanding. Uh, something, something. <laughs> Not like Christ. <laughs> but that in the womb, John the Baptist was. Remember, the scripture says there's not going to be a man like him. Like, no, no, there's not going to be a prophet like him after him. That's why even John said that. Right. So, John, John, was, uh, John was up there too. But <laughs> read this verse again. <laughs> Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 4, verse 11. Yea, speedily was he taken away, lest the wickedness should alter his understanding, or deceit beguile his soul. Because don't be deceived. That's why it says uh, deceit will beguile his soul. Evil communication corrupts good manners. Come on. For the bewitching of naughtiness that obscure things that are honest. It's witchcraft. Naughtiness is witchcraft. The bewitching of naughtiness obscures things that are honest. Come on. And the wandering of concupiscence that undermine the simple mind. The wandering of, so meaning don't let yourself wander on these things. Right? The sin enters your mind. Put it away. 
Don't entertain it, don't play with it. Because when you let it wander, it's gonna bring it to fruition, right? If you look for something enough, you'll find it. So you must be mindful of that, right? But the, but the point was, like, even Christ was tempted to that extent, right? And it's because we're not of this world. It's a constant battle going on within us. Galatians 5.17, you, you guys know this is one of my favorites, I stay bringing this up. Galatians chapter 5 verse 17 For the flesh lusteth against the spirit And the spirit against the flesh And these are contrary the one to the other So that ye cannot do the things that ye would So this is the state that we live in Among sinners In our pilgrimage here So the flesh lusteth against the spirit And the spirit against the flesh They are contrary one to the other so that you cannot do what you do. Meaning, each one is pulling against the other to not allow it to do what it needs to do. So the flesh wants to do one thing, the spirit is going to pull you back. The spirit wants to do one thing, the flesh is going to pull you back. That's the temptations that we live with as we walk among sinners. Right? Uh, read verse 16 first. Verse 16. This I say then. Walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So this is how you avoid it. It's not saying that you will never feel it. It says if you walk in the spirit, then you won't fulfill the lust of the, the, lust of the flesh. Come on, read it, 17. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other. So that you cannot do the things that you would. So this is why you have to have devotion. This is why you have to have that enthusiasm and love for this truth. Because there's a constant battle raging inside of us. And if you don't put that in your forefront, with the pollution of this world, if you're passive about it and you're not on guard, you're going to mess up. And it might not even be the most obvious of mistakes. But it'll be a compounding effect of subtle things over and over. And, and in some way, that's probably worse because it, it's so subtle, right? All these little subtleties that it never, it, it never gets caught by you or anybody else. So you never get to get it corrected. And then now you have to wind up dealing with the consequences of it. Let me get John 10 and 34. Because it's not a light thing when he says, walk in the spirit and that the spirit. Going into us being foreigners here. We're gods among the earth. The scripture says we're gods that will die like men. So, like, that means this is like a prison for us. People talk about purgatory, right? Right? Oh, hell, really? But yeah, we're in it. We're in it. But from the sense of purgatory being right, where you're supposed to go and pay your penance, right? According to Catholicism and all that other stuff, right? This is that place. Where, where, where we must be in our pilgrimage among sinners, right? And try to endure through all of this. Read this in John 10. St. John chapter 10, verse 34. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said, ye are gods? Come on. If he called them gods unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken. Right? So he says, we are gods. And we're going to read that in Psalms 82. That's what he was quoting. But he says, he, he called them gods. Meaning those who Christ was speaking about in John 17. Meaning the Israelites, us, unto whom the word of God came. Who did the word of God come to? Israel was only given up to Jacob. He did not deal so with any nation. So to whom the word of God came, to whom Christ came, to whom the commandments and the statutes were delivered to, God says, those people are gods. Let's get Psalms 82 and 6. He says the scripture cannot be broken. So no matter what anybody else tries to tell you, they tell you anti-Semitic or anything else, the scriptures cannot be broken. Psalms 82 and 6. The book of Psalms, chapter 82, verse 6. I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. So he said, I have said, ye are gods. We are, right? So again, understanding from the Psalms. And he says, and all of you are children of the Most High. 
We start at verse 1. Verse 1. God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the gods. So God stands in the congregation of the mighty. Where, which congregation is God standing? Who is his chosen? Who has he called his, his, his people? Israel. Us. He says he judgeth among the gods. The God judgeth among us. Other gods. Right? Come on. How long will ye judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked? So he says, knowing that you are gods and that the one true God sits amongst y'all and, and judges amongst y'all, how long are you going to accept the persons of the wicked? How long are you going to accept this present world and that evil communication? Right? Come on. Selah. Defend the poor and fatherless. This goes into us letting our light shine. This goes us into teaching and speaking this truth and not remaining silent about it. Right? Come on. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. <coughs> Deliver the poor and needy. Rid them out of, thy, of the hand of the wicked. So when you come to awareness, when you start to work on yourself, as, as our Father, the benevolent God, does, we must behave like that as well. So what do we do? We must attempt to try to deliver them out of the hand of the wicked by preaching this truth to them, by delivering. It's the example is there. The blueprint is there. And doing it with devotion, with love. This is why in Ezekiel, there's another scripture that talks about if you see people, and like basically if you know this truth and you don't share it with people, and they die in their sin, their blood is on your hand. That's a selfish God then. That's not a benevolent God. And we, if we're going to be like gods and we're going to judge, then we must emulate those, those actions. That's that Godhead mentality. Right? Come on, read. They know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. It says they walk on in darkness. They don't know. So it's up to us to let them know. Those of us who have been gifted to understand must let them know. Hold this. Give me Micah 3 and 1. We're going to come back to this. Micah chapter 3 verse 1. And I said, Here, I pray you, O heads of Jacob, and ye princes of the house of Israel, is, is it not for you to know judgment? So he says, Hey, is it not for you to know judgment? Right? We should understand that. We should know this. Just like Paul said in 1 Corinthians, I say this to your shame. So there's no reason for others to walk on in darkness. We certainly should. Because we should know judgment. Because God sits in the congregation of us. And we are God's. Come back to Psalms 82. Read verse 5 again. Psalms chapter 82 verse 5. They know not Neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. Come on. I have said, ye are gods, and all of you children of the Most High. But ye shall die like men, and fall like one of the princes. That's our purpose. That's the same thing that happened to Christ. He died like a man. He suffered and died like a man. He lived. He taught. He was tempted. He resisted. And he died. And then he was risen again. And guess what? We will rise again also. That's right. I'm telling you that when we say Christ is the example, there's levels to that as well. This way it says, oh, you will surely partake of my cup. Which means, it's all, listen, you are not going to survive, none of us, the more severe tribulation where, where you're being killed, taken from your families, locked up just for professing Christ, because that day will come. You won't survive that if you're not devoted to this. You're going to turn. You're going to turn. You're going to deny, you're going to turn, and you're going to sell out. Yeah, this one lives here, that one lives there. This is where they meet. Remember how we were reading about during the Greeks last week? How they hid in caves just to keep the Sabbath day? You, know, you, don't think, you don't think something like that's going to happen again? Well, I mean, we're not going to go to caves, but we're going to have to try to be in secret about it. Right. Except us understanding it's those last days. We're going to get caught. And, we, and, and it'll be that nobody has... And let me tell you, some people are actually going to... They're going to say lies about us. Whoever it is. And some, and some will actually believe it. 
And that's what happens when you're not set up right, when you're not fit for the battle. Read on. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for thou shalt inherit all nations. It says, Arise, O God, to judge the earth. So when it says, Arise and depart in Micah, this is not your rest, arise and depart from her, that's what it means. That we need to judge the earth, right? The most high judgment is going to be with a sword and with blood and with fire and brimstone and all that stuff. But our judgment is by going out and teaching. That's how we depart. Judge the earth. Discern what's right and what's wrong. Realize that, that we're strangers here. We're visitors on a temporary stay. And do what needs to be done and what's required of us. Let me get um, 2 Ezra 7 and 56. Now, I can give you this all you want. I can tell you this. You can nod your head all you want, but you must be persuaded of your own minds. All right? This, this is the trip. Nothing I nor others can do can put you into this frame of mind to accept it. I can't, I, we can't force you. We can't drag you to do this. Right? We can judge and force judgments according to what the scripture says, but nobody can make you do anything. Nobody can make you see anything save yourself and the Most High. So that's, that's the funny thing. All this information is here, but if, if you don't apply it, right? So it was a, they got that saying, knowledge is power. And then someone else said, knowledge is in power. Applying that knowledge is power. Just knowing something don't mean anything. Right? How many times you run across people in the street? Oh, yeah, I know, but is you like? Just bought some chicken on the Sabbath day, right? Smoking Newports, right? Talking about you're about to go hit up the shoddy. <laughs> Let me get Second Ezra seven fifty six. Second Ezra chapter seven and verse fifty six. For while we lived and committed iniquity, we considered not that we should begin to suffer for it after death. We don't realize that. We forget that, right? Judgment against an evil work, right? Don't come speedily. So we're like, oh, right? Come on. Then answered he me and said. This is the condition of the battle. This is the condition of the battle. Come on. Which man that is born upon the earth shall fight. We are in a battle from when we are born. And this is the condition of the battle. Come on. That if he be overcome, he shall suffer as thou hast said. If you be overcome by this world, if you let this evil communication corrupt you, if you, you fail to have devotion for this walk, if you make this place your rest, and you don't acknowledge that you're just here temporarily, it says, you will be overcome, and you will suffer. Come on. But if he get the victory, he shall receive the thing that I said. We will receive the promises of the kingdom. Come on. For this is the life where of Moses spake unto the people while he lived, saying, choose thee life that thou mayest live. Oh, wait, I thought the Apocrypha was in canon. It's quoting the Old Testament. I thought they say that the Apocrypha is not, but there's so many references to the Old Testament here. You know? What's going on here? So let's go to where Moses said this. This actually used to be one of my favorite scriptures in camp. Let me get Deuteronomy 30 and 19. He says, this, the, this is what Moses was talking about, that this is the condition of the battle. What? Go ahead, read this. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life, that both thou and thy seed may live. Therefore choose life, that both thou and thy seed may live. Come on, go back to where we were in 2nd Ezra. Read verse 59 again. 2nd Ezra chapter 7 verse 59. For this is the life where Moses spake unto the people while he lived. So what he was saying, Moses, was that if you're overcome by this world, you're going to suffer greatly and pay for it after death. But that if you get the victory, you'll get the things I say. Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 14 is the things of the victory. And Deuteronomy 28, 15 through 68 is the things if you're overcome, right? Now, we were overcome at one point. But it's letting us know that if we get that chance again, right, through Christ, then let's do it right so that you don't get that fail. This is the condition of the battle. And it is a battle, brothers and sisters. It is a battle. 
And if you're in wartime and you're on the battlefield, do you get comfortable? Yes, sir. Do you do, do you act like that place is your rest? I'm trying to make sure that your, your your encampment is all super set up. No, those things are designed to be break down and go. I'm ready. I'm ready to go if I need to go. And it's all right if this stuff stays behind. So why why do we treat it any different? Because we get seduced. It's deceitful, this world. And though it's polluted, we fall in love with the different things of the way this world is run and how it's structured, right? Read on. Choose the life that thou mayest live. Nevertheless, they believe not him, nor yet the prophets after him. They didn't believe him. They didn't believe the prophets after him. Come on. No, nor me, which have spoken unto them. Come on. That there should be such that there should not be that there should not be such heaviness in their destruction as shall be joy over them that are persuaded to salvation. So we need to be persuaded to salvation. There is a level of persuasion that needs to happen. And the persuasion isn't telling lies or embellishing. The persuasion is the truth. So you are either persuaded to repent because you're afraid of the destruction or you're persuaded to repent because you want the reward. It's or both. But usually it starts with that you want to avoid the destruction. And that's how the persuasion starts to happen. So likewise, you must be persuaded to accept this scripture. And guess what? You've got to persuade your own selves sometimes. You have to be able to focus on it on yourself. Get Acts 13.43. You'll see throughout the whole scripture... They talk about persuasion. Again, I'm just going to touch on a few of them. The book of Acts, chapter 13, verse 43. Now when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. Paul and Barnabas used persuasion. It says they persuaded them. A lot of times we think about being persuaded, you're like, oh, nobody got to convince you of this. No, that's not true. The scripture says you got to convince and exhort the gainsayers. So you must be persuaded to believe this because before this, many of us couldn't see any light at the end of the tunnel. So the level that we're coming out of goes to show you that you can overcome the pollution because how polluted was I before I started to repent? I use myself as an example. Right? I was in some things I was one of the worst offenders. Alright? Each of us knows what we dealt with and what lifestyle we came out of and how we dealt <laughs> and to what extent. And I was persuaded to believe this. I was persuaded to say I gotta change. I mean, you want to talk about being grown and to do such a 180 degree in your life, of course everybody's gonna think you're damn crazy. Uh, that was wrong with you. Oh my gosh, you're not the same. Remember that you went to? good. That's the thank you. That's a compliment. You say I'm not the same. That's my intent because I'm awake now. First I was asleep. Now I'm awake. So you must be persuaded. Acts 18 and 4. The point is that they'll, they'll make you think that being persuaded is a bad thing. And it's not. It's not. Acts 18 and 4. Acts chapter 18 verse 4 and he reasoned and he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks and we understand we went over our Jews and Greeks class what that's speaking about and it says he persuaded the Jews and the Greeks by reasoning with them every Sabbath by excuse me giving the sense reading distinctly bringing that stuff out so my aim in this class and any time I teach is to persuade you to apply, to persuade you to do what needs to be done. You think, I, I don't like being angry. I'm not an angry person by my nature. So when you guys piss me off, it's because I care, because I understand. And I'm like, gosh, these people still aren't persuaded. I got to go through this topic again. I got to do this again. It's aggravating, real frustrating. It's not good for my health. <laughs> Second Corinthians five and ten. Second Corinthians chapter five verse ten. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Each and every one of us individually must all appear before the judgment seat 
of Christ. Come on. That everyone may receive the things done in his body. Everyone for everything. Remember, we were reading every idle word we shall be judged for. Every idle word. We will account for all our actions. Come on. According to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. And guess what? None of us is all the way good. So we all have something that we need to account for. All of us is going to have some bad that we need to account for. But God is just that we will also get credit for the good. Right. So we're going to account for the good. And we're going to get make sure that you get the pay. He's, he said, ball print. You, you all right over there, Isaac? You nervous? You dropping stuff? He said, oh, my goodness. Read verse 11. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God. Know the terror of the Lord. Understand that we're all going to sit in that judgment seat of Christ. That's what I say. That should be the number one persuasion for us, right? Knowing that terror. We persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God. Come on. And I trust also are made manifest in your conscience. And that's what I trust. That by these classes coming out, that it's made manifest in your consciousness. In your consciousness so that... Not in our, my presence only, not in our presence only, but that when you're alone, when you're home, when you have those moments to make those decisions, whether to be devoted to this or to yourself, you'll be able to have it in your conscience and be persuaded to do what's right according to what God requires of us. Let me get Romans 4.18. Romans chapter 4 verse 18. Who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations. This is Abraham, right? Come on. According to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. Right? So the promise was that he would be the father of many nations. Right? Come on. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead. Meaning, he was a hundred something years old. He couldn't get it up. Right? So he said, his body was dead. How's he going to bring forth seed? How am I going to be the father of any? He says he didn't even doubt for a minute. Sarah laughed. Abraham didn't doubt for a minute, the scripture tells you. That's, that, that's the measure of that man's faith. Talk about an example. Be like, I want to be like Abraham. And not even for a second. He didn't say, oh, that's impossible scientifically. My body doesn't function like that. God said it. It's going to happen. Come on. When he was about in 100 years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He didn't even consider that Sarah's womb was dead. Right? So I said he was 100 years old. Can you imagine having a baby at 100 years old? Do you see what 100-year-old people look like today? And I'm talking about healthy ones, right? Let alone the ones that are all decrepit. But even a healthy 100-year-old. Like, I don't even know that they can even put the effort in. Right? But anyway, go ahead. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. It says he staggered not, not even for a moment, but he was strong in faith and he gave glory to God. Come on. And being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. So we gave an example of being persuaded by terror and being persuaded by faith, right? So you see Abraham's example of being persuaded by faith. He said, I was persuaded. God said it. And I didn't think that I was 100 years old. I didn't think that Sarah's womb was dry. He said, and God is going to do it. And he surely did because we're here today. And, right. Right? and so was Ishmael because he was a father of many nations with Ishmael. But through Isaac and Jacob, we are here today. And you want to talk about a great nation, the father of many Look how numerous the Israelites are right. in the earth today. He saw that. He didn't waver in that. It, it was not something that was unfathomable to him. Because he understood. He understood that I was a stranger in a strange land. Right? I was a sojourner. And it was symbolic with him too, right? Because where he came out and he dealt. He, it, it's, it's, he physically, right? Because he had a land that he came out of from a physical sense. And what? He, there was even some contention he had where he said, I have no land to bury my loved ones, whatever he because I'm a stranger amongst you, right? So even he was a stranger in a strange land. So it, it's not a light thing when you go into the whole, us being strangers and pilgrims and everything, right? But he says he was persuaded by that. Did we read verse 22? No. Verse 22. And therefore it was imputed 
to him for righteousness. It was imputed to him for righteousness. How many of us can say that we have that much devotion? You lack faith when you're not devoted. But Abraham wasn't. This is why I say Abraham, God called Abraham a friend. You know, like you want to be friends with the cool person? I'm like, I'm your friend. Yeah, I'm your friend. God called Abraham a friend. So that's that's a special relationship he had because Abraham's faith was 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 like none other to, to be able to roll that way. And he was always testing him to kill kill Isaac. I mean, even after all that, because it was it was light work to him. He he, ne he never wavered with it because he was all right with it, right? I think they're just getting ready. I don't think they're still in yet. All right, let's go to 2 Corinthians 1 and 20. Almost done. Kind of. 2 like Corinthians 1 and 20. Second Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 20. For all the promises of God in him are, are yea. And in him, amen, unto the glory of God by us. All the promises of God are yea, meaning they will happen. And in him, amen. So, right, so we all agree. Unto the glory of God by us. Read on. Now he which establishes us with you in Christ, and hath anointed us is God. God hath anointed us, come on. Who hath also sealed us, and given and giveth the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. So... I want to try to get through this because I want to talk about what he means when he says the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. We are anointed by God. He's sealed us and he's given us the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. Real quick, just look up the definition of earnest. Okay, there it is. A serious and intent mental state. A serious and intent mental state. You'll hear Christian pastors talk about live your life with purpose. And their purpose is prosperity in this world. They, they don't have you thinking of being a pilgrim and you're on a temporary stay, right? So the earnest of the spirit is the seriousness and intent mental state of that Godhead mentality, right? So it says God's anointed us and he sealed that in each and every one of us, but we have to access that, right? So we have that earnest of the spirit. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5 and 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 1. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God. So he's talking about your literal home. You know, if your apartment, your house, right? If your earthly house, your physical house were dissolved, we have a building of God, right? And it will be dissolved. The elements are going to melt with fervent heat, right? Come on. In house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. We must have confidence in that and understand that. Read on. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. How many of you can actually say you earnestly desire your house from heaven? Too many of us are content with building things in this world, building things in this life, building things up here. And like I said, don't get it twisted. Your measuring stick is, if it takes you too far away from your devotion to God, then maybe you need to reconsider if that's something you should be doing in that moment, in that time in your life. So if you're able to balance the scales of both, where you can still be devoted, but do what you need to do as commanded, as we're going to read in Jeremiah 29, all right? Then you're okay. Because then, then you get the dumb questions. Well, how do I know this? How do I know that? Oh, I love God, but I need to get this done. And the fact that you said, but, no, you love God, that's it, right? Remember, Abraham didn't hesitate for a minute. He said, you're going to be a father of nations? Boom. Kill Isaac? Come on, Isaac. Let's go. Right? <laughs> <laughs> like, straight up. Like, he stopped. Whatever he was doing, he said, come on, Isaac. Yeah, grab the knife on the way out. <laughs> Why, Dad? Just shut up. Come on. Well, Don't ask questions, boy. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right? So it says we must, we should be groaning, earnestly desiring, with a serious mental intent to be clothed with our houses which from heaven. Not just the kingdom. You know what our house that's from heaven? It's not this body. 
right? So if you're fat and you can't lose weight, you should be groaning for your godly body, right? Your brother can't gain no muscles, he ain't got no calves, no biceps, nothing, no matter how much you eat. You should be groaning for your heavenly body. Uh, hey, it, it says the sister's gonna build like calluses. Right. Not a, not a tool sheds, all right? Right. <laughs> Right? So that you can't be you can't be out there with your pot belly and looking like that if they're gonna be built like palaces, right? So it says we should be earnestly groaning for that. Not content, not trying to build things in this present world, right? But don't get it twisted. Jeremiah 29 and 4. We're gonna come back to 2 Corinthians 5. The book of Jeremiah, chapter 29 and verse 4. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, unto all that are carried away captives, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem unto Babylon. Build ye houses, and dwell in them, and plant gardens, and eat the fruit of them. And the reason he had to say this is because our people were so serious, the ones that were trying to repay, about that they were pilgrims, they were sojourners, that you'll, you'll get the mindset the opposite, like, well, I don't need a good job because Christ is coming. I don't need to buy a house or build anything or do anything better because Christ is coming, right? No, it says contrary-wise, in, in, in your sufferings, in all that, build these things, plant gardens, eat the fruit thereof, come on. Take you wives and beget <laughs> sons and daughters, and take wives for your sons, and give your daughters to husbands, that they may bear sons and daughters, that ye may be increased there and not diminished. Right, that ye may be increased and not diminished. And not diminished. Why? Because we don't know the hour or the time. So you're saying if everybody had that mentality that it was soon, and then if it's not in your lifetime, you've left nothing behind for the future generations to be able to have a, the, that, that light to guide themselves forward, right? Now, surely the Most High would fulfill that, but guess how he does it? By us doing this. And he leaves future generations to continue on the mission, to continue on the pilgrimage, because he has to send people back to do that stuff, all right? Um, I was going to read more on this. I'm not going to read that. Uh, go back to Corinthians, yeah. I'm trying to... Make sure I get in what I want to get in. So go back to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. Five and two. Chapter 5, verse 2. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. We should earnestly desire to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. Come on. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. Clothed with what? If the world dissolves, clothed with what? What is it talking about? It says we will not be found naked. If the world dissolves, we will not be found naked. It's real easy. Yes. Eliezer. Israel. The laws. Israel. <laughs> oh, gosh. What are you going to say? I was going to say, uh, close with the commandments of God. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. Naked, See, that's not wrong. That's not wrong. That was trash, but it's not wrong. <laughs> Ishad, same thing? I was going to say, righteousness. Come with righteousness? Uh, you got to expound on that. Uh, Jehokim? Small is it talking about our white robe? I don't know. Is it? Dang, he's real deep. No. Okay. That's a question. I wanted a question. Now you give me a question? No. Let me get Ephesians 6 and 10. Oh, oh I knew that. Damn, that's trash. <laughs> Go ahead, Ephesians 6 and 10. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. This is this is us, right? 
traversing amongst sinners, living amongst sinners, living amongst this spiritual wickedness in high places. It says if the world dissolves, you shouldn't be found naked. You shouldn't be found and use this as an excuse for all the bad deeds that you have to account for. It says we will not be found naked. We're clothed with the whole armor of God. Come on. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that he may be able to withstand the, in the evil day, and having done all to stand. And having done all to stand. And having done all to stand. Acknowledging, right, you're an Israelite, keeping the commandments, also realizing that we are pilgrims, and we are here on a temporary stay and a temporary journey as we navigate this present world. Let's go back to Ephesians 5, oh, I'm sorry, uh, 2 Corinthians 5. Read 3 again. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 3. If so, be, if so be that be clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened. This tabernacle is our present body. This and this body that we're in, we do groan. Come on. Not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. What? That's that flesh and spirit warring against each other. We groan because we don't want these things on us, right? Paul says, I die daily. Come on. Now he that hath wrought us from the self same thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. He's given us the earnest of the Spirit. Each and every one of us has it in us. We just need to use it. Come on. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. Understanding that we realize that parallel that we walk. That yes, we are at home. This is the tabernacle that God gave us. This body you have now, that's what he gave you, right? So obviously treat it with respect. This is why we don't do drugs and all this other stuff, right? Keep yourself that way. But also understanding that we're not home with the Lord. That we are sojourners. Come on. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Although we can't see it, just like we open up in Hebrews 11, we embrace it. Even though they never saw and the promises were far off, they embraced it and overcame. Come on. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body. And to be present with the Lord. That's like that movie Heat, where he says, I don't have anything I hold on to that I can't leave in five seconds flat when the heat coming. And the heat will be coming from the most high. So it says you should be willing to have everything that you have in this world taken away in an instant. Knowing that we have something better. That we have that earnest spirit. Having the confidence that God has something better. Read that again, verse 8. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to Confident and willing, come on. And willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Come on. Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. Right? So it says, wherefore we got to labor regardless so that we can be accepted of him. He said he's going to show great praise for our pilgrimage. If we live it right, if we do it correctly, right? Isaiah 46 and 9. Wait, is that what I wanted? No, Ephesians 1 and 3, sorry. I'm trying to like condense it. I have longer scriptures. I'm, I'm just trying to hit a few of them because they're going to start in like 15 minutes. Ephesians 1 and 3. The book of Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who have blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he had chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. He chose those who he was going to receive before the foundation of the world. Come on. That we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Three. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, According to the good pleasure of his will. The adoption of children, the adoption of sons, you'll read that, right? So whom pertaineth the adoption? He predestinated that Israel would be his chosen seed. That the Israelites would be his tabernacle, right? So read on. To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, 
the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he hath purpose in himself. His good pleasure meaning the way he wanted it, the mystery of his will, is that Israel shall be saved. And by the way, in the peculiar way that we would be saved, and these promises that he has for us. Come on. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in, in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Meaning the dead in Christ, that the spirit returns to the Father, they will rise first, and those of us who are here when that day comes, that are going to make it, he's going to unite us together in that heavenly kingdom. Come on. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance. We've obtained that inheritance. Come on. Being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his, of his own will. He worketh all things, and we are predestinated according to his own will. His thoughts are not our thoughts. Come on. That we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted. After that, ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed. Ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. The earnest of the Spirit, that Holy Spirit of promise, is us understanding and feeling the confidence that we're not married to this world, this life, whatever it is, because we understand and we have the faith like Abraham that what he said will be there. What is right will be right. What shall be done shall be done. Come on, read. Which is the earnest of our inheritance. So the earnest of the spirit is the earnest of our inheritance. That confidence and understanding that that is there. That's why we do what we do, right? Because we understand that that, that promise will be fulfilled if we do it. If not, why, why linger here? Why play around? Enjoy, go enjoy the world. Go live in there. If you're not going to be fully committed, if you're not going to be devoted, you're wasting your time here. You don't have that earnest of the spirit and the expectation of the inheritance of the kingdom. Come on. Until the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of his glory. Let me see if I got time for this. Isaiah 46. I got two more scriptures. Isaiah 46, and then we're going to do second Ezra. Isaiah chapter 46 verse 9 Remember the former things of old For I am God And there is none else I am God and there is none like me We must remember the history We must remember the former things of old We must remember that all our fathers Everyone understood we were sojourners And what the promises are Come on Declaring the end from the beginning. This is the counsel of his own will. God declared the end from the beginning. Come on. And from ancient times the things that are not yet done. And this is the prophecies that have yet to be fulfilled. Come on. Saying, my counsel shall stand. The scripture shall not be broken. And I counsel shall stand. Come on. And I will do all my pleasure. And he will do all his pleasure. And his pleasure is to give us that inheritance. His pleasure is to save us with a peculiar salvation. So that we can have that eternal life in the kingdom. All right. Um, let's go to Second Ezra sixteen and one. This will be our last verses. Second Ezra sixteen and one. <coughs> Second Ezra chapter sixteen verse one. Woe be unto thee, Babylon and Asia. Woe be unto thee, Egypt and Syria. All these world powers. All, that's symbolic of all the ruling powers in the world. Woe be unto them. Death is going to come upon them. Come on. Gird up yourselves with cloths of sack and hair. Be well your children and be sorry for your destruction is at hand. This is part of that earnest of the spirit. In order for us to have the kingdom that we need to have, Christ ain't coming to set the United Nations in order. To set Trump and the governments in order, they must be taken down so that they can be replaced by us. Come on. A sword is sent upon you, and who may turn it back? A sword is sent upon them, and who may turn? The sword of the Lord is sent upon them. Christ is coming with all the angels in that V formation with destruction, right? To tread them like the wine press. Jump to verse 17. Verse 17. Woe is me. Woe is me. 
Who will deliver me in those days? Right? This is what we should be thinking. Who's going to deliver us in those days? Come on. The beginning of sorrows and great mournings. The beginning of famine and great death. The beginning of wars. And the power shall stand in fear. The powers that be shall stand in fear. The rulers of this world will stand in fear. Come on. The beginning of evils. What shall I do when these evils shall come? Come on. Behold, famine and plague, tribulation and anguish are sent as scourges for amendment. Read on. But for all these things... They shall not turn from their wickedness. And the day will still be in their wickedness. You'll have some of our people that will still be in wickedness. Come on. Nor be always mindful of the scourges. Read on. Behold, vittles shall be so so good cheap upon earth. Oh, damn. That chicken sandwich from Popeye's only $4. That's a good deal. I think it's, boy. That thing uh, hits, boy. It's a big piece right. of chicken for $4. Oh, right. That's the truth. Ooh. Right? Vittles are so cheap on the earth. I can afford this. I can have this. I've never had these things before, right? Come on. And they shall, and they shall think themselves to be in good case. Because you're gonna be so comfortable here. You're gonna be so cushy. You're gonna be thinking, man, things are good. I'm in a good case. Come on. And even then shall evils grow upon earth, sword, famine, and great confusion. And not that it's wrong to be in a good case. We read that in Jeremiah 29. But it's saying, don't be comfortable because even then. As you're comfortable, and that the Lord allows that level of, of comfort, right? It says evils will still be increasing on the earth. The end times will still be coming towards where it needs to be. Jump to verse 38, last scripture, 38 through 40. Verse 38. As when a woman with child in the ninth month bringeth forth her son within two or three hours of her birth, great pains can pass her womb, which pains when the child cometh forth, they slack not a moment. Come on. Even so shall not the place be slack to come upon the earth. And the world shall mourn. And sorrow shall come upon it on every side. Read on. O my people, hear my word. Make you ready for the, to the battle. And in those evils be even as pilgrims upon the earth. So he compares the, the, the gradual progression to the end times to a woman in labor. It's incubating, it's growing, and it says, but once those labor pains come, they're going to come. And then what happens? They get closer and closer, right? Your contractions more and more, and then the travail and everything comes. And he says, so amongst all those evils, brothers and sisters, be like pilgrims in the earth among them. Be ready to go, right? When the heat come, be ready to just let it go. Have that confidence and that desire and that willingness to accept that thing, right? And move forward. So I pray y'all get some understanding. I had to rush a little bit at the end, all right? Um, and it looks like they'll be getting started in a couple minutes for the headquarters class, all right? Sure. We used to scream black power while Heron was pushed. But at the end of the day, nothing's in vain. IUIC has been given a vision. The tents of Judah has risen. Many has attempted the mission. Minor murmuring, omitting, and missing the mark. Just reading that he had the flame of fire in his eyes gave us the spark. We on Paul's mission. We out on the road, purple and gold. From Mexico, Cuba, Haiti, Ghana, Sierra Leone. 144,000 boots banging, concrete crackling. These are how our men repented at heart. The scriptures is proof, IUIC, we deliver the truth.